We know there are many choices in Internet radio and the staff and host of L.A. Talk Live would like to thank you for choosing the Internet's hottest destination for the most eclectic sound and invigorating talk. This is L.A. Talk Live. We are more than just talk. Hi, and welcome to Mastermind Live with Susie Pruden on L.A. Talk Live, where we're more than just talk. And um, I have a fabulous guest for you, absolutely extraordinary guest for you, and he's not here. (laughs) So I'm going to go call him to tell him to call in, and we're going to take a station break early to give you some fabulous announcements while I go find my guest. And uh, we'll be right back. Still don't know what I was waiting for, and my time was running wild a million dead end streets and every time I thought I got it made it seemed the taste was not so sweet so I turned myself to face me but I've never caught a glimpse how the others must see the faker I'm much too fast to take that test change it to change yes Don't wanna be a richer man float through my eyes but still the days seem the same and these children that you spit on as they try to change their worlds are immune to your consultations they're quite aware of what they're going through change To blow up and out of it
Sports Monopoly, inviting you to join me every Monday at 11 a.m. for my new show, Hooked on Onyx, spreading motivation and inspiration through wisdom, experience, and music. So don't forget to tune in to my new show, Hooked on Onyx, Mondays at 11 a.m., exclusively on LATalkLive.com, the Talk Live broadcast network. You can also catch us on iTunes Radio, R&B, TuneIn Radio, Live 365, Radio Flag, and AHA Radio, or watch and listen directly at LATalkLive.com. Reality Radio, handcrafted for your listening and viewing pleasure. This is LA Talk Live, and we are more than just talk. Hi, this is Susie Prude. Hi, and welcome back to Mastermind Live with Susie Pruden. I'm Susie Pruden on LA Talk Live, where we're more than just talk. And I just had the funniest experience because my guest, David Corbin, has been trying to reach me, and I gave him the wrong number. Oops. David, are you there? I am here. Yay. So my guest is a phenomenal gentleman that I know through CEO Space. Well, yes, clap. We're both on the faculty there, and um, I guess I met David about two years ago, and David is a master, master, master business coach, and what he does is he illuminates the negative, and what it says is harnessing the positive power of negative thinking. Now, most people think that you have to always be positive, but sometimes when you find the negative, you find out what really you can create that is positive from the negative. And David, tell us a little about your background, how you came to be such a renowned speaker and consultant. And I you know when, when Bernie talks about you, I mean, it, it's almost as if he's got you on, well, he does have you on a pedestal in, in terms of he really honors how truly extraordinary you are. And so tell us why that's so. <laughs> Well, my kids would tell you that he's completely wrong and there's nothing extraordinary about me. You know, uh, I could leave uh, the office of a cabinet member or the CEO of a Fortune 10 company and uh, think, wow, man, I am pretty extraordinary. And then you come home and your kids remind you that you're just a, a goober and uh, you're dad. not so great after all. Uh, he just did. <laughs> I don't, I don't know that I'm extraordinary. I have been blessed with some extraordinary opportunities uh, where I uh, would have some ideas and we could implement those ideas. Often they're questions more than ideas. Um, and we've gotten some tremendous uh, results. So, um, you know, I don't know why uh, anybody would say anything like that about me except that I have been blessed and fortunate and I've been able to work with organizations to help uh, and individuals to help them successfully get more of what they want, which helps me get more of what I want. And it's very ecological and wonderful. And I think God smiles when people help each other like that. That's true. So, so give us an example of something that you've done for a company that was in real trouble? Oh, gosh. Well, it's funny because I've been a turnaround specialist in a number of different organizations. I mean, a a 31-year-old massage therapy college that was going to go bankrupt. Uh, They're the only one in the country who doesn't associate a bachelor's and a master's degree in touch therapy. Um, And then there was another company that the largest residential real estate agent training company, independent, in the country, again, they were going to go bankrupt, and now they went from bankruptcy, and they're at about six million dollars a month. So what did very, you? Very, very high EBITDA. What did you do? Uh, are, how did you do it? Well, I'll give you an example with another company that you heard of, and this is a company that sells pizza, uh, but not Joe's Pizza around the corner, or even Ray's Pizza in New York City. But a company that uh, the I'll give you the name. Uh, no, I'll I'll I'll, I'll hint at it because you know contracts. It's a company. It rhymes with Schmamino's Pizza. Okay, uh-huh. you so, got it. Yeah, I do. Schmamino's. So, so, yeah, so a multi-billion-dollar company, um, and they brought me in to help illuminate what they're doing. You know, see their profits were pretty low. Um, why? Because 
people buy pizza based upon the last coupon that they get in the mail, right? And you and I'm sure listeners would relate, yeah, I bought pizza, you know, for delivery and I just pretty much buy whoever had a coupon blown in my penny saver, my newspaper or a magazine, you know? So when you look at that, their company, they brought me in as the illuminator and they said, you know, if we, if we do that, it's not a very good thing. We want to illuminate that. And as you know, Susie, I believe, you know, the illuminate model is you got to face it yeah, and follow it yeah. and fix it. And so when and you face your facing it is the hardest part. Well, you know, they were smart enough to say, you know, we're going to be taking our company public. We need to get more profits out of this thing. Uh, let's bring this Corbin guy in to illuminate. So they faced that the profits weren't good. Now let's follow it. Let's carry that out into the future. If our profits are not very high, we're in deep doo-doo. And let's follow it not just into the future. Let's follow it into the past. Why are we in this situation? Well, let's, we'll hire Corbin to come in and do that. And uh, so here's what I did. I found out through research in my team that, you see, most people don't know what they're going to eat for dinner um, by 4.30 p.m. 70% of Americans in particular don't know what they're going to have for dinner by 4.30. So these people thought they were in the fast food business, Susie, but they weren't. They were really in the crisis intervention <laughs> I was business. going to say, sounds like a crisis <laughs> to me, yes. <laughs> So, so, That's so, funny. so somebody, somebody calls up and says, listen, I've got two kids and a neighbor's kid and two adults and I need to feed them. What should I get? Which is like you, you're dialing, you know, you're dialing the 911. What should I get? Right. And you're put on, you're put on hold. Oh, no. Who wants to call? No You don't way. want to call suicide prevention or crisis be put intervention on hold. No. and be put on hold. Uh-uh. No. You know? Welcome to such and such pizza. We have two blah, blah, blah. Please hold. We'll be right with you. It's like, oh, my God, I'm calling in an ambulance and I'm put on hold. Yeah. So when I, when, I, when I illuminated that and said, you know, we're really in crisis intervention and we shifted the culture in certain parts of the country that we worked in originally and said, so here's the deal. If you're crisis intervention, you need to have solutions for these people and make it so that you can emotionally or meet their emotional needs. So we shifted it from please hold to, uh, hey, I got two kids and a neighbor's kid and two adults. What should I get? We switched it to not a problem, sir. That's what we do. Well, you're going to want to get our special number C. Now, that's three big discs of cardboard topped with fake cheese and all kinds of crap. And, oh, a big bottle of sugar, water, and caffeine to keep those little SOBs happy and bouncing off the walls. And the customer goes, I'll take it. I'm so excited. Thank you. I'll have it. You see, so they, because we taught them to solve for the problem. And when you face it, follow it, and fix it, you move forward and you say, what aren't we facing? Let's follow it into the future, follow it to the cause and fix it, which is to minimize or reduce those negative factors. And now we move into the promised land, which would be loyalty, profits, and the like. So there's an example of, of, of what we had accomplished. And it generated um, hundreds of millions of dollars oh, yeah, but in I wanna, uh, profits. I want to ask a specific, because cause I'm curious, is so with that company, they would have one or two people answering the phone did they increase their their phone lines so that there was always somebody able to answer the phone? No, not not one bit. It was all done in how they answered the phone. They didn't really need to bring more people in. So their cost of full-time employees did not change. Their effect, their modification of behavior did, and their effectiveness changed demonstrably and measurably. Wow. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah, that's pretty a, cool. that that's very cool cuz I I can just see this bank of <laughs> people answering the phone so that the, I was taught when I went in I was a fran- I bought a franchise a number of years ago and one of, part of our training was to tell us never let it go to voicemail always always have somebody <laughs> answering the phone which makes total yeah. sense to me and yeah, yeah. We can and we sometimes we can and sometimes we can't. But as much as possible, <laughs> I have people there in my office answering the phone. And because if they if it goes to voicemail, the person will just call the next hypnotist. And so yeah, right. we, we didn't want that. We wanted them constantly calling us. And so uh, I would be in the middle of a conversation with somebody 
in the next room, the phone would ring in the other room and I'd say, excuse me, I have to go answer the phone. I would never let it go to voicemail unless we were all on the phone and then it automatically went to voicemail. But that's fascinating that there were no increase of costs. All it was was just, just a different delivery. Yeah, cost of training. <clears throat> and then they went on after I left. And some of your listeners will probably remember when they began to illuminate, which is the process that I do, they started to illuminate on their own, um, which is to um, a face, follow, and fix. And they basically went on national television during the Super Bowl and said, our pizza tastes like crap. Well, they didn't say crap. They said cardboard. But some of your people will remember, yeah, they actually on TV said, you know, we got feedback from you. that, And so we're putting customer satisfaction questionnaires and, and ideas, comments, and suggestions on the outside of our boxes so we could learn more about what you want, how you want it, and when you want it. And they actually went into that campaign, which was the natural the natural illum- extension of the initial or seminal illumination work that I had done. And then I always try to have my clients – I try to leave my clients with sustainable, iterative processes so they could do it themselves. They went in on their own, and they illuminated and said what they said on national TV. It was kind of cool. That's very cool. And I had another client, Kaiser Permanente, did the same thing. And, very cool. And so that's what I enjoyed doing. That's very, very cool. So, But you didn't get paid for that because you gave them that process, and they did it. Yeah, I got paid handsomely on the first the go-around, and I, I like to – uh, leave sovereignty, which is to say, I want to teach you how to do yeah. it, and then yeah. uh, and then they send clients to me and blah blah blah. Great! I just started a new program in my company because um, when when a person finishes with me, they, they they're pretty much done because they get their results so quickly. But then I don't hear from them again, and I and I want to, so I created this insanely cheap program. It's called Anytime. And if you pay me $1,000, you can call me four times in a year for, for a session, which is insanely inexpensive. Everybody's buying it, so I'm very happy. <laughs> I love it. Great, great idea, Susie. Well, great I keep, idea. It, it keeps me working with the client beyond what we started so that they stay in my loop and I stay in their loop. And uh, who knows? Down the road, they may want another intensive. Who knows? I just thought... Well, I don't want to lose this client, but they don't need me for three months, so let's do this way. It's being flexible. That's all. Mm. So another one. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to say in the who knows factor, um, I never leave it at that. As the illuminator, I never leave it at the who knows or, you know, God only knows. I never leave it at that. I want to know. I want to know why they're not coming back. I want to know if. Uh, price of access is a factor. I want to know if a thousand dollars for four sessions anytime during the year is. I want to know this sort of stuff, you know. And so you've tested it. Now you know, and you see what works. Yeah. And with your service, my natural reaction is, you know, Susie Pruden, two hundred and fifty dollars an hour. That's a pretty damn good bargain. Well, considering you know, and I'm thinking, it's. Right. Yeah. Well, it's normally a thousand dollars. So when I told the client that I was working with before, I said, "It's only two hundred and fifty. If you find out in three months that you need to have a session with me and you call me, it's going to cost you a thousand dollars. Why don't you buy four for a thousand now?" And she did. Of course. I mean, to me, that's an insurance policy. Yeah. I mean, I'll buy those credits. Okay. You know, you you got it. Like buying yourself. It's like buying yourself a gift card. You know what I mean? Yeah. I do because I I created it. I was th- I was thinking, okay, how can I keep them without having them to do this which they don't need? And oh, I'll just try this and it worked. But my Great my idea. attitude good, good is throw it up against the wall if it sticks, keep doing it if it doesn't change it. That I cool. I'm, I'm having fun. So, how do you introduce the concept of accentuate the positive and illuminate the negative? I mean, I would think that most most companies would be frightened to face what they don't want to see. Oh, it's true. Um, they they typically don't. And, um, you know, my job is, you know, for, you know, I used to be a psychotherapist. And uh, there that. my job was always to comfort the afflicted. That was my job. And, and now I realize my job is to afflict the comfortable, <laughs> <laughs> you know, is, is, is to say, you know, hey, you know, that little – 
that little sore on your forehead could very well be melanoma from what I, you know, and, and well, I don't want to hear that, <laughs> you know? So, um, you know, I'm not gonna, uh, you, you know, you, you, you can't, you can't force feed maturity. No. Uh, but I never have a hard time. First of all, you know, I've been doing this for a while. So my reputation is kind of there. Um, you know, Bernie, you know, obviously is one person who speaks highly. I'm happy that with a career that spans as long as mine and, and, you know, my bio and CV is pretty sexy. Um, by the time I get somewhere, I don't have to really do a lot of convincing. And I'll tell you what, Susie, at this stage in my life, I don't want to convince a nobody a nothing, I you know? Um, so I don't, I don't really find myself having to do a lot of convincing, but if I do say like Columbo, gee, I don't know if it's important here, but if you, if you do what you keep doing, you know, this is going to be happening in the future. Uh, they pretty much get that wake up call and I don't have to do a whole lot of convincing. That's good. So I, I, I really truly understand about the not wanting to be convincing. People ask me all the time, well, there's so many hypnotherapists. How can you be so expensive? I said, there's nobody in my league. Yeah, that's great. Uh, it's that's just, great. that's it. And so th that's it. And so but aren't you afraid of the competition? No. As far as I'm concerned, there isn't any. I know what I'm doing and I do it well. You know what you're doing and you do it well. And the people who you work with trust you and know that the reason that they're hiring you is because you're going to come in there and make what isn't working work. But not by running away from it, by facing it. So, Well, it, I like to speak all languages. So there are some people that speak that language. Other people speak the left uh, brain analytic language, and they want, the, they want the evidence, in which case I'm prepared, and say, well, you know, I don't really want to tout my story. Call such and such, see what they have to say. I've got a, um, I've got a client who's in town, and you've met him. He's a PhD in organizational development and whatnot. And he brought someone in who's uh, another client now, um, you know, one begets the next, and this is an amazing company, and together we're forming an alliance, and we're going to start taking a company like Smartwater off of their throne as number one, and I believe we'll be number one and whatnot. So when people say, well, I want to, you know, where's the beef, where's the evidence of what you do, it's very easy for me to say, well, you've heard of such and such, such and such, give them a call and see what they say. You know, it's, I, I do want to do that also, because some people want the data yeah you know, they want to know yeah. that i you know took this native american tribe when i was a president of a public company from abject poverty and third third uh generation uh welfare to having a tremendous amount of cash reserves such that every one every member of their tribe uh students who has a c average or above gets a full ride to college they're like really yeah, well, that's fact. And so that's the same nice principles story. we use with them. Yeah, so people sometimes want to see proof. They want to say, you know, they say, where's the beef? Right, know? yeah. So what's your favorite client? Oh, gosh. Honestly, I can't, you know, I'm going to visit my son tomorrow in uh, in Texas. And, and if somebody would say, who's your favorite child? I couldn't tell you. No, you, you, you dig? Because yeah. I kind of yeah. like his sister, too. Right. Yeah. Uh, I don't. You know, I have so one child. My favorite client? I don't know. So huh? I said I have one child, so it's easy. But I have two grandchildren, so I understand. Uh, so I don't know who my favorite client is. I honestly, uh, actually, I don't have clients. I have friends, uh -huh. uh, and that's that's the truth. You know, I do a lot of mentoring. I love it, and um, I don't have any favorite clients. I have individuals who were my clients, and I fired them. So they're not my favorite client because they weren't doing the work and I don't want to waste my time. And my clients typically, you know, they fly into town. I pick them up at the airport, bring them to my house. They spend the night and the next day we, we work all day. So these are people that become, you know, yeah. they're friends, you know what I mean? And there's no, there's no formality. There's a lot of uh, uh, vulnerability, authenticity and whatnot. So by the nature of the work that I do, generally speaking, these people are, you know, I'm close with them. I, I cook them the smooth, I, I prepare the smoothie in the morning or else uh, I go, we go get the eggs out of the chicken coop uh, and I cook them breakfast. And so they're all, um, 
you know, they're all sort of my, my friends. Now, when I work with cabinet secretaries or president of use companies like that, they don't stay at my house and I don't go to the chicken coop with them, but we do get sort of psychologically and egotistically naked with one another where we don't play games. So we develop an honesty and openness. We've got a trust. So I really get to know who they are and I love people as you know, and it's in that that we increase our effectiveness. So in answer to your question, I love them all for different reasons. Well, that's, I understand that because I have a similar feeling. I, I will fire a client or I won't take one if I don't, if I know that it's going to be a royal pain. If, if, mm. the, if, if, if I get somebody on the phone who wants to work with me, but no matter what I say, they say, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh-uh. Nope. That's not going to work yeah. for me. And, yeah, um, I don't want to, I don't need any butts in my business uh-uh. either. No, because it's it, it you want a client who's I mean when I I'm a client to a lot of different coaches and it would be insane for me to not do what they tell me to do since I hired them to tell me to do it. Uh, yeah, uh, well, there's that. I mean, I'm, and I'm not going to accept willy nilly or wholesale. I mean, I'm going to I still reserve the right to ask questions and say, can you give me some some stuff uh, uh, and whatnot. But, you know, in my case, I just can't afford to have a client who doesn't do what it takes to be able to get the results and carry my reputation in their hands. I just, I won't do that. I, that's, that's actually a very important point. So you work with all, all different types of businesses. And what's the biggest, um, most challenging situation that you've come across? Um, that's a good question. I actually had someone at CEO space uh, who I was mentoring and we um, essentially I got fired. Um, uh, he had actually paid me and decided, I don't, I don't want to work with you anymore. Mm-hmm. Why? I, I, I don't know. I'm not going to tell you. And that, that was the biggest challenge for me because it left me like I've never had anything like that in my life before. Did you ever find out? No, never did. Is that Never person, is can't, that per- even, can't even imagine. And, and it, it, it hurts. It hurts my feelings. Yeah. Uh, I know that there's probably a lesson in there and I don't know what it is. So as a former gestalt therapist, I don't have closure. And oh. so that was, and that happened um, in 2013. Um, so that was kind of, that was kind of crazy. So that was the toughest thing. That, I could see that, where that would be. That, it's a weird answer, I guess. It's not probably what you're after, but to be honest with you, it's kind of weird for me. Well, it's very vulnerable yeah. of you for for you to have said that, and I mean, it just shows that you know there's a there is the It's like the those of us who are placed as the quote unquote experts, we're not supposed to be. Um, we're not supposed to have any stuff like being fired. It's like me being homeless eight months after Oprah. You know, people go, what? Mm, mm. And uh, you? After all your six, you? And yeah, me, I did it. And so to, mm. to is that person still at CEO Space? Uh, no, I don't see him. Uh, I hadn't seen him uh, any longer. So it's kind of interesting. You know, I also, it's so funny. I just came back from this amazing deep dive uh, eight day residential personal development program, you know, and, uh, uh, I ran into someone there who I know and they said, Oh my God, are you teaching here? I went, no, no, <laughs> I'm here to learn. <laughs> really? Are you? Right. <laughs> Hell right. yeah. Right. You know? Right. And by the way, it was the most courageous thing I've done possibly in my life was to go into this to take it the next level because, you know, um, if we're not in integrity with what we teach, we're, we're frauds and con right. men. And, you know, I'm known as the illuminator about you're either green and growing or ripe and rotting and nothing's neutral and you got to face things. And, you know, last year, you might remember this, Susie, last March, I illuminated, faced, followed and fixed. I faced, you know, if I keep uh, gaining weight, <laughs> Uh, and the doctor said I was already by definition obese because I was 189 pounds. 
um, and smoke my cigar every day and drink two to three glasses of wine every day and drink my coffee every day, if I follow that out into the future, um, not, it might be too late for me to fix anything. You right. know? So as you know, I gave up my daily cigar. I gave up my coffee. Uh, I gave up all television. Um, I gave up uh, wine all at once, you know, and uh, started. Do- so I, I was real serious about illuminating. And as you know, I also released 41 pounds, yeah. 41 That's pounds. A lot so of people go, oh, my God, you look incredible. And I go, I know. <laughs> and you know? beyond that, though, you feel incredible. Oh, my God. And my doctor said, my doctor of 26 years, he said, David, you've never been healthier, you know. So and then then in March of this year, after that accomplishment, I said, OK, now I want to now illuminate for other things. And so that's why I went to the Hoffman Institute. Jot that down. It's awesome. The Hoffman Institute. Okay. And um, it wasn't cheap, but it was well worth it. And. I did a deep dive into personal development like never before. It was scary as hell, but it was incredible. In fact, my beloved, my girlfriend, uh, soon to be ex-girlfriend, <laughs> uh, is there now. I, it was so incredible. I, I just felt compelled to gift her with that experience and the value uh, of that. So it's an amazing, amazing process. So that's what I'm working on this year. I wow. worked on the body. Now I'm looking at the mind and the spirit, and and I'll just continue to keep growing because you're either green right. and growing or ripe and rotting. Okay. Right. And I don't so, want to be rotting. No. What What is something that you could share from that experience that you had during those eight days that you feel would benefit people listening? Um. I'm a woman trapped in a man's body. No, I'm only kidding. I know that. <laughs> I think that would that would make news, right? No, you know, I, I learned a lot of amazing things. One of which is, you know, when we're born, uh, you know, mammals take humans take longer to raise their infants than any other animal. Yeah. You know, and humans are also sort of the most flawed, and so you know when you're Parents aren't able to give you what you need to feel loved, lovable, safe, and the like. You tend to make certain decisions at a precognitive level. Mm -hmm. And those decisions of I'm not good enough, Mm -hmm. I'm not safe, I'm not lovable, or whatever, are pretty close to the surface if you get scratched. And if you play back those patterns and how you've lived those patterns in your life, you could see all of the deleterious effect it's had in your in your life. So people look at me as the funny guy, the confident guy. The truth is, I carried low self-esteem around most of my life. And in this process, to see where that came from, and to see, oh my goodness, I know where that came from. That's the way my mother was. And I'm just imitating my mother. And... Or, you know, other behaviors that I got from my father that I just decided at an early age to imitate them so I'll feel loved and safe. So when you carry those things out, their process of identifying your patterns and what's the origin of the pattern, exploring those patterns, and then how to remedy or cure for those patterns uh, after you've seen all the deleterious and negative effects of those patterns. So it was pretty heavy. And... My gosh, I could see why I've been jealous my whole life of my girlfriend or other wives and all those sorts of things. Holy moly. And I'm so grateful for the opportunity to go through this process. And yeah. it wasn't easy. No. Oh, my God. But it, you, was tough, you, but you, it was great. You knew that going in that it wasn't going to be easy because you were facing you. You weren't facing – you were facing you. And we always we – always, you know, when we really finally do look at that and go, oh, okay, got a little work to mm-hmm. do here. And um, I've been doing this kind of work on myself as well as with others since the early 80s when I divorced my husband and found out I had a mind. And then it was, wow. Mm-hmm. I mean, I was a fitness expert. I counted to eight. <laughs> that was my job. <laughs> That's pretty good. I like that. You know, but this is good. You'll, you'll, you'll get a kick out of this. My last gymnastics show that I 
choreographed before I um, let the business go was um, I did a choreographed for my gymnast, my, my top team, and I choreographed a floor exercise for them to do all at once together to take five. And I was so excited because my whole fitness career, I counted to four. One, two, three, four, two, two, three, four, three, two, three, four, four, two, three, four. But now I'm counting to five. One, two, three, four, five, two, two, three, four, five. It was so much fun. I figured that's it. I've hit the pinnacle of my career. I can now move on to something else. That's brilliant. Yeah, so you re- increase things by a 20% increase just by doing that. That's hysterical. Next, you want to go into the uh, the eye doctors, the optometrists, who they say, what's better, one or two, one or two, one or two. You teach them a three, and you're a hero. Oh, you know you just increase. That's them. actually a very good idea because you get so confused with the one or the two that you ne- pretty soon don't know which is better. And then you end up having oh, glasses yeah. that you can't see your computer. So, that's um, hysterical. That's hysterical. So, if you, how do people get in touch with you so that they can take advantage of your brilliance? Well, smoke signals is best. I read smoke signals. Okay. It's, it's the way. Um, you know, uh, the people who, who want to reach me easy, can easily reach me if they just know my name. You know, David Corbin. And, and that's just Google people you. Find yeah, I mean, you know, my email is, is david at davidcorbin.com. That's easy. Facebook, you know, I mean, people who want to find me, which is great. You know, I just did a couple of keynotes in New York a City on my way to the Hoffman Institute. That was like two weeks ago. And, you know, I always, I'm curious, how did they find me? You know, this client found me online and this other client found me online and hired me to speak in Cancun. And as a result of that, they went, oh, man, we loved your keynote. We'd like you to come and do a keynote at our employee appreciation. They, had pay, they, they said they pay for 600 of their employees to go to Cancun, Mexico. Wow. And, um, and now they, and they sent me down there, which is great. And then I convinced them to pay for my girlfriend to go down with me, too. And that was kind of cool. And then they hired me again. So... I always, you know, I, I like the repeat and referral business. It, it tells me I'm doing the right thing. But people find me just by either knowing my name, David Corbin, and they can find me at david at davidcorbin.com or uh, www.davidcorbin, you know, all that sort of stuff. It's okay. easy to find people today if you're looking for them. That's true. That's true. So what have you got coming up that's exciting for you work-wise? Well, you know, I'm an entrepreneur. Um, I'm... I'm an inventor and I'm real proud that, you know, I, I invent products and build companies around them and then sell the company. I didn't uh, know I'm that. I'm on my ninth version. Yeah. I, I, um, I, gosh, I've won some awards, which is cool. I invented some software and I won the innovation of the year and it was pre- presented to me by Margaret Thatcher, Maya Angelou, Tom Peters, uh, Newt Gingrich. So that was kind of a cool invention thing. One of the companies I own now is called Aesthetic Audio Systems. And, you know, it's Aesthetic, A-E-S-T-H, AestheticAudioSystems.com. It's a really cool company. And we put music in hospitals, in the waiting rooms and public spaces, that creates a healing space, a healing environment, really a sacred space, so that the, the music in the women's imaging waiting room is designed to impact relaxation but the music in the surgical waiting room which is you know for families who are waiting for one of their loved ones who might be in there for an hour they might be in there for three hours that music is designed to compress time and space perception you see and so and in staff areas we might have a little sonic caffeine at 10 30 or 3 30 <laughs> you know so this music this company um I developed with some partners, uh, and it's about nine years old. It's been generating profits uh, and revenue since day one. Um, My partner wrote the book, The Mozart Effect, Mozart for Children, and 31 other books, and he passed away last year. And my other partner designs hospitals using sacred geometry. She's in her 33rd year of business. She's Years ago, she was looked at as, are you crazy? Sacred oh, sure. geometry, oh, sure. artwork, are you nuts? Now right. she's the most sought-after speaker in the field of right. arts and in healthcare. So 
that's now I have a question. I have a I have a um, an entrepreneurial question. Have you ever okay. thought of putting sure. subliminals in your music? Say it again. Say it again. Have you ever thought of putting subliminals in your music? Positive thoughts. Um, I did. I did about uh, two years into the business, about seven years ago. And uh, we did a bunch of uh, research on it, anecdotally and otherwise, not for the effectiveness of it, because subliminal is wonderful. But in terms of the market acceptance and right. take rate, it destroyed. It yeah. would destroy our marketing yeah. because <clears throat> the left brain analytic dweeb weenie administrators are afraid yeah. of the ramifications of putting in subliminal because they're going to get they're going to have to disclose it and yada, 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 and they're afraid to do that, so um, we, 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 we didn't do that. Yeah, I did um, a, uh, a, it was then a tape, now it would be a CD or an MP3, with Louise Hay in 1989, a whole series of su subliminals, and I did a, my Meta Fitness book, my Meta Fitness audio, and the video, and then we had a, a subliminal uh, tape. And I gave mm -hmm. it to my doctor, and my doctor put mm -hmm. it put it on in her waiting room. She said after the first day, she noticed that the patients used to come into her office very agitated because they were sick mm -hmm. and there's something wrong. When she started playing the subliminals in the waiting room, by the time they got into her office, they were peaceful, they were calm, and they could talk rationally. And that's why I ask. But, but I do know that a lot of people, they'll, they'll ask me with, when I do a process, are there any subliminals in there? And I'll say, no, no, you don't have to worry. Everything you hear is what you hear. And because um, they yeah, are. Yeah, so, and, and we know that it has effect because there's been an awful lot of research on that. Yet, if you can't get the dogs to eat the dog food, What's the point? it's never going to be used. Yeah. And if it's not being used, what, what? it's by definition what? Useless. Excuse so you. I agree. Uh, we get the same measurable and demonstrable effect of relaxation without the subliminal, mm -hmm. and we don't have the pushback. So yeah. it's unencumbered with pushback. So. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds fascinating. What would you be able to do something use in schools where you get kids to uh, be able to focus better? Well, so my business partner in the Mozart effect demonstrated, um, and there's been a number of uh, peer-reviewed studies that um, that they can indeed they can get focus, attention, attentiveness, retention, all sorts of effects uh, by utilizing certain music. In his particular case, using parts of Mozart's music. In fact, my partner. Rest his soul, really amazing guy, Don Campbell, Don G. Campbell, amazing, amazing being. And we lost him about two summers ago. Um, Don was the only Billboard top 10 artist who neither performed the music nor composed the music. What he did was intelligently assemble yeah. Mozart's music. And you might have heard of Mozart for children, Mozart for babies, Mozart yeah. for the. That was Don. And. So, and he had a lot of research that was done around that. His last book, which is fabulous, called Healing at the Speed of Sound, Healing at the Speed of Sound, really does sort of a meta-analysis of sound and noise on the human condition. And he goes back to ancient tribal beats and chanting and, and you know, the monks and all that sort of stuff, just showing how music impacts things from education to relaxation to spiritual development and like there's no shortage of data today on the effect of sound noise music and whatnot on the human condition so education is at the forefront of that and dr georgi lozanov's work in sophia bulgaria on how to learn languages etc cetera, etc cetera. it's all right there and there's a lot of science around it and my partners in copenhagen uh, we did a test of uh, uh, 6,500 uh, 6, uh, patients, uh, and we were looking at the effect of, of of video and audio on things like pain mitigation. It's just such cool stuff. We did we check this out, Susie. You'll dig this, right? We looked at 6,500 patients pre and post surgery, and the people that looked at our program, uh, which was uh, audio and video which is relaxation, before and after surgery, 
they their pain meds requested was down by forty three percent. Yep. The, is that amazing? Yep. That's forty three percent less medication they had to take to be able to recoup and not be in pain. Yeah, just I know. With audio and video. I have clients who will come to me before surgery. And I had one client who was having a hysterectomy, and I made her a process. And I, t- I said there will be less blood flow there during the operation, that the operation would, the body would, what else did I say? It would accept the, the surgery and, at the, and begin the healing process immediately afterwards, and there would be no pain. So when she, she uh, the doctor brought her her prescription, she says, what's this for? He said, for the pain. She said, I don't have any pain. <laughs> he said, what do you Isn't mean? Isn't that cool? What do you mean you don't have any pain? She said, I don't have any pain. He said, you have to have pain. Everybody has pain. She said, no, I do a hypnosis process that tells me I don't have any pain. I don't have any pain. And it was great. And, the, and another one um, was told she'd be in the ICU for at least 24 hours and that it would be this, it would be that, it would be this. So I, I made her a process, said she'd start the healing process immediately as soon as surgery was over. And she never went into the ICU. And the doctor said, I don't understand it. You're supposed to be in the ICU, but you're not bad enough to be in the ICU. So, Could you yeah, believe it? I know. It's wonderful. It's absolutely... It's- I just I get such a kick out of it because the traditional thinking, I call it psychosclerosis or hardening of the attitudes. They're like, no, we don't want to use that because why? But it works. Yeah, but. Yeah, but. Or else, the- well, that's just a plea... That's a placebo effect. Yeah, but it works. Yeah, it's a placebo effect, and it works. You know, I'll tell you, Susie, it's so funny. Two things. Number one, I don't know if you know the 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 the, uh, the uh, skier Peekaboo. What was her name? Peekaboo something or other. You remember her? No. Peekaboo Street. I don't know. And the joke is, is that she donated money to the ICU in San Diego, and they're calling it the Peekaboo ICU. Oh, anyway, sweet. but that. <laughs> Sweet. It's a bad, stupid joke. But That's sweet. what we've done with music, and and it's you could have your hypnosis tapes, and you could tell her that you're not going to bleed out as much. Mm-hmm. And the interesting thing is, if during the surgery, a lot of the surgeons will listen to music that keeps them awake, and they'll have fast-paced, Ooh. fast-paced, loud music to keep the surgeons awake. And they don't care or know that what's happening is through brain entrainment, not only is their pulse going up to keep the surgeons awake, but so is the the patient's pulse are going up, which causes them to bleed out more. Right. You see, and if it wasn't for your hypnotic tapes and the induction, they would bleed out even more. And the, the, so it's it's the surgeons working against the positive patient outcome. I, Isn't I, that crazy? Well, I do believe that's pure ignorance. I don't believe that 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 a surgeon would. I mean, all you need to do with a patient is stick earphones over their ears and give them the suggestions, and the surgeons can be wearing can be listening to um, high high stress music, which, which I think is not the smartest thing in the world to do. When you're doing surgery, anyway, because you don't want to miss. And if you're, no, I think it's um, it's uh, in cases because I've worked around this area. In some cases, it's ignorance. Uh, in other cases, and I think it's more often, it's arrogance. I was just gonna. It is arrogance. Yeah. It's Take it's the words it's, out of my it's mouth. sad. And um, but it is what it is. And happily, we are shifting as a society. There are very few hospitals that I go into that don't have massage therapy, Reiki. Jinshin acupuncture, energetics, um, uh, acupuncture, acupressure. So happily, we are shifting, yeah. you know, as a society. But until and unless, you know, my latest book, uh, Preventing Brand Slaughter, it's about a hospital, and it really shows the um, the relationship between the arrogance of some of the of the uh, surgeons and the humility and integrity of some of the frontline employees in this particular case. It's a business novella about a security guard, not terribly sophisticated, but is really living the embodiment of the values of the hospital and how he bumps up against this arrogant robotic uh, surgeon and how through the story, the two of them connect 
uh, and the surgeon's heart opens up <laughs> to the uh, value of love, caring, integrity, uh, and brand integration and brand integrity. And so it's kind of a neat story. So, you know, that's uh, happily we're seeing more and more of the open heart space in these hospitals, no pun intended. Right. How many books have you done? Uh, right now, uh, my literary agent is carrying my fifth book to the, he says he thinks he'll sell it to McGraw-Hill in two weeks. And I'm like, oh, yeah. That is fabulous. I just sent my book into Workman Publishing. So they published four of my other books. I want them to publish this one. So, Good luck. Yeah. Great. Good for you. Terrifying moment terrifying because I haven't talked. It was really a great one when I called two years ago when I started this book. And this it, it, I'm so resistant to this book because I haven't done any exercise for 30 years. So I'm totally out of shape. And I was very much in shape. So I'm the, I'm, I'm the reader. And it took me two years. And uh, so I called the, the publisher and I hadn't spoken to them in 30 years. Took my call immediately and said, well, you haven't been in the public for 30 years on fitness. Uh, I said, don't worry, I'll get back quickly. But it's been quite a challenge because now I have to do the book. And that's why Good I'm... Good for you. It's a blessing. Susie. I know. It's a blessing. I know. It's like your story last March. When you when you uh, took off 40 pounds, you stopped the alcohol, you stopped the coffee, and you stopped the cigars. So you did it. And, uh, yeah. and yeah. now it's... It's a blessing. <laughs> yeah. 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 So... Um, uh, I'm looking at you. What does illuminated organization or life look like? That's a question that here and oh, you know what's more? Why don't managers and leaders invite the illumination of the negative factors? Why why do they run away from it? Um, generally speaking, the manager it used to be one manager per eight employee. Now it's about one manager for 23 employees. Mm -hmm. So these managers are over their head, man. I mean, they're treading water. It's kind of tough. They're forced to do more with less and stuff. And then some employee goes, uh, hey, Susie, um, I think we have a problem in such and such. And you're the manager going, oh, my God, I can't handle one more problem. Uh, 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 Bob, listen, get back to work. You know what you need to do. I've got my stuff to do. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll deal with that some other time, okay? And they're just kind of overloaded, and they and, and, and they also feel, oh, it's another problem. I don't have the resources of mm. time and money and even know-how, if I'm honest, to solve for that problem. So we kind of put it in the dark, you know. Get back to work. You know, we got stuff to do, just you know. It, it and so. you know what happens when you put problems in the dark. Um, <laughs> like mushrooms, you know, they like grow. Like mushrooms, <laughs> they, they multiply, right? So um, – and, but, but when you put them in the light of day, like this, daylight is the greatest disinfectant in the world. Sometimes they evaporate like vampires. So I think it's because, like you said earlier, the surgeons might be a little ignorant. I think managers, they just don't know how to illuminate the negative in a positive light. So what we teach them is, is to, number one, thank somebody for bringing this you know, to the fore. If you smell smoke, I want to know about it. Exactly. You know what I mean? Oh, exactly. Um, and so thank you. And be honest and say, you know, I'll tell you what, we're working on these projects and, and I don't know that I have really the resources to solve this. I don't know that I have the money. I don't I know we don't have the time right now. And I frankly I don't even know how to solve it, but let's capture this. Let's not let it get away. Thank you for that. And then we can maybe swarm all over it next time we have a meeting and see if we can't solve for that. Does that make sense? Well, yes, yeah, Susie, that does. Thank you. Now you feel heard, right? And that's Instead major. Of, oh yeah, I mean, I mean, I, I, I will tell you, one of my clients had a disease in it. Uh, I won't tell you the name of the company, but it rhymes with Schmeiser Permanente, <laughs> and they had a disease in there. I called it Kaiseritis, which is they had a bunch of employees that just checked out. Man, they just they were punching their clock, but they didn't give a hoot because why? Because they, they, they would share ideas. Ooh, what if we did this? Or, ooh, we may have a problem. And the employee and the, and the manager just said, you know, just shut up and get back to work. They didn't say it quite that way, but they kind of did say it. Um, and I would tell the management, you know, you had a lot of these people that checked out. They go, yeah, I know. And I said, well, 
uh, congratulations, because you gave birth to them. What do you mean? Well, when you hired them, they weren't that way, but you created them. How did we create them? You didn't listen to them. You didn't listen to them. They didn't know how to say thank you and, and, and how to, you know, let's put it on the board. Let's deal with it when we can. They didn't know how to do that. So they dishonored their people. So I think that's basically why. And when you look at the society today, uh, we're in denial. I mean, I show a Tums commercial when I'm at a uh, CEO space of a guy, you know, in a county fair and he puts a, a corn dog in front of his face and the corn dog just smack he goes to put it in his mouth and it's oh, I know I know that gets, com- yes I know the commercial you remember yes and, and and it's just ridiculous and here's the body saying don't, don't need do it. this don't don't do this, this to in. me don't do this to me yeah and, and 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 it ends with don't worry about it if is your body is your is your food fighting you fight back with tums tums yeah. tums tums it's like so take a pill and you can eat this crap. Right. And that's the society we live in. I know. So that's why managers, they go into denial. And I say, you know what? Let's take, you know, let's take the, the Band-Aid over that potential melanoma so you don't have to look at it. And let's get it. Let's get let's it biopsied. Take, you let's know? get it taken care of. So that's why. I think. They just don't know how. They so, just don't know how to illuminate. We're going to have to end now, but I want to invite you back to continue this conversation at another time because I'm finding the conversation fascinating and I'm learning things that I didn't know before. So I know my my listeners and my viewers are learning things they didn't know before. And I have loved having you on my show, David Corbin. And if you want to get in touch with David Corbin, it's David Corbin, D-A-V-I-D-C-O-R-B-E-N. Uh, on B-I-N. Google. B-I-N. Oh, I'm sorry. It's like giving you the wrong phone number. It's B-I- yes. I'm, I'm, dys- <laughs> I'm dyslexic. What can I say? Um, B I N. It's okay, okay Sandy Prudent. <laughs> <laughs> Love you, David. I hope to see you very soon again, and I'll talk to you, and we'll have you back. And thanks for joining uh, us. Blessings to you. Lots of love. And thank you for joining us on Mastermind Live with Susie Pruden on LA Talk Live, where we're more than just talk.